Travel zone restriction ahead. Make sure you have the required permit to proceed. What? Environmental what? zone restriction ahead. Make sure you have the required permit to proceed. I'm Mike. And I'm Danny. And this sure is Petal Revolt. This episode, we're covering something truly revolting. It's the super rare Aston Martin V12 Zagato. Welcome back to another episode of Petrol Revolt. Before we get into our story about the V12 Vantage Zagato, it's an ideal opportunity to tell you guys to go across to our Facebook page and post your petrol revolting stories. Your cars, your bikes, we want to see them on our social media. Also, go and check out our website where we've got our fantastic range of petrol revolt merchandise. So to understand how this Aston Martin B12 Zagato came to be, we first need to understand Aston's design language and DNA. Aston at its first heyday in the DB4, 5 and 6 era of the 50s and 60s. And then Aston had a second heyday in the mid 2000s with the V8 Vantage and the DB9. That design language, that design DNA from the mid 2000s has carried forward all the way to the current day because arguably in the current cars, the DB11 and the V8 Vantage, there are key pieces of that DNA present in those cars. Who better to talk us through that Aston design language than the architect, the designer himself, Mr. Ian Callum, CBE. Welcome Ian. Well, thank you. Thank you. So before we get talking about Aston's design language or your design language, Ian, how does it feel to be sat in front of this art gallery? Because this, this is all your work. And now for me, I see this every day and I've seen this every day for the last 20 years. But uh, obviously you've taken a break from Aston. Maybe you've not seen all these cars arranged like this for a while. How does it feel to walk in here and see them? You know, it's, it's exciting to see them together. You don't very often see so many Astons in one place of different types. Um, I always get a real buzz when I see them again because each one is a story to me and each one has its own personality. And to see them together, it's just a fantastic feeling. You know, it kind of reminds me of what I've done, which I often forget about. So it's very satisfying. Yeah, each car has got its own style and its own story. And how does it make you feel like even today, some 20 odd years from Vanquish release, that there are still owners, buyers of these cars that come to them new and experience that, that wow, that aura that Vanquish has for the first time. And that just keeps happening, new owner after new owner, year after year. How does that make you feel? It's very, it's very flattering that people still love the car so much. But you know, I saw one on the road unexpectedly the other day, and even I turned around and looked at it and thought, that car's got real presence to it. And that's what it was meant to have, presence, and it still works. And I always believe that if you get a design right, it doesn't matter how old it is. It can be of an age, it can be part of an era, but if it's right, it will be right forever. And I find it very exciting people still see that in the car and, and still cherish them, you know, it's good. They're classics now, of course, which is always a little bit disturbing because it makes you realize how long ago it was. But it's very satisfying to see that people still enjoy them. I've always said that uh, the two pleasures I get out of car design, it's a bit like writing music, I presume. It's the process of designing. That's a great joy and making something. And then the joy you give to others afterwards, you know, and people look at the cars they've bought and they love to look at them and that joy that others gain from it gives me great satisfaction. So let's talk about one of your first creations at Aston Martin, the DB7. Now, what most people won't realise is the turbulent process a car takes in design. From that initial sketch where you must consider crash and all sorts of legislation through to other constraints that happen through the process, budget constraints, design constraints. Now, the DB7 in particular took quite a turbulent path because 
it did start originally as a XJS replacement, but then you took that with fixed surfaces, fixed structures, made the design Aston and created what is regarded as a timeless classic masterpiece. Talk us through that turbulent process of turning that design into something so perfect. Okay, well, when you start off any design, you, you need to know all the facts. What's the objective? And that's quite difficult sometimes because the people you work with have different objectives. You know, they want the best package, the best performance, the best aero, but it also has to be the best looking. And often there are conflicts there, and especially with package. But you're kind of aware of all these issues at the back of your mind. Having gone through a number of years, the experience tells you you have to be aware of them. You have to know what's coming uh, within the project that may be constraining. However, it's important you can put them to one side when you start to being creative and creating the first sketches with a slight notion that things will have to be manipulated to, to fix the issues. And that's how I usually start. I start with sketches. I try and create something which excites me in paper. And that whole process is about an idea in your mind and you have to put it down in paper for other people to see. It's your language, it's your communication. You can't let the idea just appear in paper kind of randomly. It's got to come from with, within you. Otherwise, it doesn't have this sort of sense of solidity about it or this sense of totality about it. So that's the first stage. And then through the whole process of of feasibility, engineering, cost, all these things that you mentioned where there are inputs that can be detrimental to the, that pure shape. My job as a design director was to hold on to the spontaneity of that first idea. Because through that process, which is very complicated, very long-winded, they take anything up to four years, things are being pushed and pulled, you have to protect the original design. Now, you have to be pragmatic about it. There are certain things you can and cannot do. And you have to find ways through it. And experience is good because you kind of know what's coming. And so uh, you, you work your way through the various disciplines, whether it be the, the chassis discipline or whether it be the body and white discipline, or whether it be the interior package, the manufacturing feasibility, the cost, the weight. All these inputs are something you have to take on board and work with and problem solve. And design's not just about creating a pretty shape, it's about problem solving to protect the shape that you've created. Now, in the case of the, the DB7, yes, we started off with a Jaguar platform. It was the XJS platform. And remember, I worked for Tom Wilkinshaw. Now, nobody knew that platform better than he did because he raced the cars, you know, and he made them win. And so he saw a lot of scope in this platform for potentially a future Jaguar. And that's, you know, it's common knowledge. That's how they cut the project started. However, not long after we commenced this idea of replacing the XGS on an XGS platform, you know, Tom realized that perhaps Jaguar were not going to be that interested in this. So he started looking elsewhere for another client, which happened to be Aston Martin. However, the fundamentals of the car, whether it was going to be a Jaguar or an Aston Martin, proportionally it had to change from my point of view. So we did two things. We, we cut the back off because the back of the platform was quite long and we took quite a few centimeters off the back. Uh, we moved the cowl forward. So we cantilevered the cowl forward from where the XGS cowl was. So all these fundamentals were engineered into the car before we really started. And that was under my direction to get those proportions right. Once we got to that point, you notice we cut the corners off, we made the front end much more rounded. That was a basis, the, the basic proportion of the car to move forward with. And then we started designing a Jaguar. Now, not long into that process designing the Jaguar, things changed and we hadn't really finished it. Uh, it was really an amorphous shape. I was trying to control the forms over the given package. The engine at that point was a V12. Um, and, you know, I, it, it was something that Tom wanted to do was to have a V12 in there. So. We designed the car over the V12 engine, which was good because it was quite a low engine. And so we have, it evolved and then it kind of moved and transformed into an Aston. Then I had to put a different hat on and I had to reestablish a lot of the details, obviously, and a lot of the form that would suit the Aston language. Now, I, 
I wasn't sure at that point what the Aston language was because I looked at the DBs, fours, fives, and sixes. And then I looked at the V cars, which were very, very different. They were quite muscular and probably more influenced by the V8s, the, 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 the DBS and the V8s. And so there was a transition of Aston Martin language through that period. And I kind of hung on to the notion that it had to be simple. It had to be easy to look at. It had to be elegant. And that really was my notion of what the DB7 should be. Clearly, the characteristics of the, the car had to contain the grille and the, and the side strike and, and various other aspects that Aston were famous for. But my main principle was to keep it simple and keep it beautiful and something that was easy on the eye, which is much more difficult than it sounds. Making something simple is more difficult than making something complicated. You know, and, and in most things in life, if it, if it looks like it's been easy, it's not. And that's something that I held on to. As we developed the car, it evolved into the shape we know today. The one caveat that came about was we, we realized that um, two things happened. The car was sitting too high and Tom had the team to re-engineer the rear subframe so the car would sit lower. So the, the car was redesigned at the back so it would sit lower down. And, and the one thing about Tom Walkinshaw, he, he understood the importance of aesthetic. The car looks beautiful, Ian, we'll sell them, you know. And fundamentally underneath, it wasn't that extravagant a car. It was a very simple car underneath. It was an XGS um, and it's going to have a V12 engine. Now, Walter Hayes, who was, a, to the, who was the MD of Aston, came along to Tom halfway through the development of the car and said, I want a six cylinder engine in this because the DBs had six cylinder engines and I want to get some of the cost out. So we took the AJ6 engine fundamentally, which was a Jag engine with a supercharger, if I remember. And we put it in the car. And of course it was taller than the V12, which meant the bonnet had to go up. And I didn't like that idea. I showed Tom what the implication was. He said, I don't like it. I said, I don't like it. And we lifted it about 30, 35 millimeters and it just ruined the, the shape of the front of the car. So he marched me into the engineering department at, at TWR and said, Ian wants to drop the engine <laughs> in front of all these engineers. They went, what? Pete Dodd was the chief engineer and he kind of looked at me and glared. And uh, Tom went, right, fix it, boys. That's the way Tom worked. Right, just fix it. So they had to redesign the front subframe to drop the engine about 30 millimeters so we could get the line of the bonnet the way we wanted it to be. And that was Tom's doing. He said, I'm not compromising the shape of this car. He said, that engine's going to go in it. And he didn't really want to put it in it. He wanted the V12 in there. But the six was going to go in and, and we had to drop the whole engine down physically, which is you know, not a small job. So both the rear was changed underneath and the front was changed. So the car's quite unique, actually, relative to the XGS. And of course, when the chassis was developed, it was tuned and tuned to be a much better driving car anyway. So the idea that it's just a Jag underneath is not entirely true. It was designed and engineered very specifically as an Aston Martin. And so we created this car. L lots of fun stories about how it came about. I worked with the engineering team at TWR to create the new body on it. The handling was sorted. And then we had to go for approval from Ford because, you know, they had the money and we were looking for a certain amount of money to build this. And, and there were a lot of people at Ford in Detroit didn't really understand the brand. Austin Martin, one guy called it, you know, we had to educate him. And he was a CFO. So, you know, we had to really get these guys on our side. So we built a running prototype for what we call program approval. That's never heard of. Program approval is usually a, a model of a car, a business plan perhaps a model of the interior. And so we built a running prototype with uh, Perspex glass with windows on it and, and such like. And we drove it into the event, the, the PA event, and it just floored them. And Tom got the money to build it and Walter Hayes got the money to build it. However, it wasn't fully approved and it still needed some budget to finish it. And Walter decided to put the car that we had, we built another couple of prototypes by this time, real steel ones, and we put it into the Geneva show in 1993. And the car had not been approved by Ford entirely. And of course, the, uh, the orders came rushing in and they had no choice. They had to put it in production. You know, that was a really clever 
slightly naughty thing on, on, on Walter's part, but that's how the car happened. Perhaps it was through desperation because in 1994, Aston are famed for selling only 48 cars. And the DB7 went on to save the company quite literally uh, in its <coughs> production run, there or thereabouts 9,000 cars. Yeah. Uh, so that shows you just how well received that car was. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the car at the time, and this was a big problem that Walter had. You know, they were building one car a week, and they weren't making any money because poor Ford didn't know what to do with this. And so the DB7 saved them, you know, and it made a profit because the investment for that car was actually very little by by modern car standards. You know, it actually saved the company financially. And if it wasn't for DB7. I don't know what would have happened to Aston. It might not be there anymore. So I have some pride in that. Well, it's an <coughs> awesome car and quite literally did save the company. No one yes. can dispute that. Yeah. You moved on <coughs> to Vanquish. So now presumably you've got a much freer hand without the constraints that the DB7 project had. Uh, Vanquish, is regarded by many as the quintessential Aston sports car. Uh, your own language, a brute in a suit. It's aura, it's styling, it's just, it's unique, it's on its own. Can you talk us through your Vanquish process with Aston? Yes, I, I was asked by Bob Dover, who by then was the MD for Aston. He called me up and he said, well, you, we know you did the DB7. We'd like you to think about doing a concept car for us. We're going to call it Project Vantage, funnily enough. You're not necessarily going to get the job, by the way. I want you to put some proposals forward and we're going to ask other people to have a look as well. And I thought, well, fair enough. You know, I was a consultant at the time. And so um, I came up with some ideas for Bob and he liked them. He said, OK, we'll give you the, the job to design this concept. And that really established me into the Aston family at this point, which I was very pleased about and very proud of. And so we created Project Vantage as a concept car. And he said to me, he said, don't design anything we can't make. So clearly he had an idea that if he could get this car approved by Jack Nasser, then we could turn this concept into a production car. And he said to me, he said, I want the car to be muscular. I wanted to carry some of the Aston heritage in some way. We discussed the Zagato DB4 GT. We both liked that car. So we wanted a little bit of that feel in it. He said, go on, you know, fill your boots, do what you want and we'll try and work around it. Now, I work with really good engineer, Dan Parry Williams, who created the, the running chassis for this car. So I was working directly with another engineer all the time to make sure we created something we could really build. And Dan designed the chassis and his team while I was creating the exterior shape. There were no constraints, really. Dan was very understanding as an engineer. He loved aesthetics, he loved style. And so as we created this car, we knew it would have a V12 engine in it. That was our, but it's actually quite a low engine, so it was quite good. And we designed the car around the shape that we wanted rather than something that was constrained by another platform because the platform was completely new, completely unique. The one thing I did want, because I wanted a lot of rake in the screen, was a cantilevered cowl, which is quite difficult which would mean the engine would sit underneath the cowl because the engine was sitting quite far back, but the screen was forward. And it's a common problem these days with front engine cars. So that's quite a demanding factor, but Dan managed to pull it off and we created a proportion over the V12 engine that, uh, that, that worked for us. And so you had a free hand. And what was really good was we had one design review in the whole process, and that was for the concept car. Jack Nasser flew in one day, Bob Dover was with them. It was a Saturday morning. He came to look at the clay model, which was still just a clay model. It wasn't even painted. And Jack was used to looking at cars like that, of course, within the Ford world. Uh, we had a bacon sandwich. We looked at the car. He gave me some comment about the tail lamps, which we subsequently changed. And he said it looked too American at the back, which was an interesting comment. I mean, Jack was Australian, of course. So he had a kind of balanced view on, on, on cars. And that was the only design review we had in the whole process of that car. Now, normally, you must remember, when you go through the production of a car, that I remember at Ford, certainly subsequently at Jaguar, we'd have 20 or 30 design reviews with various people. You know, and it was, it was tiresome, because everybody had an opinion. 
a lot of the reviews were about feasibility and what we can't do and legislation and cost, but a lot of it was about subjective opinion. The Vanquish had one design review and it was a very passive one and that was it. Now, when we, we showed the car in Detroit as a concept, it, it received so much favor and because DB7 was doing well, Ford said, well, let's can continue with this brand. And we found the budget to build the real car. Now I had to go back there and make the car feasible, but protect the design. And believe it or not, every surface in that car had to change. But we had to do it in a way that nobody would notice. The whole body side, for instance, came out 25 millimeters. The reason being that the key barrel, which was inherently a Ford key barrel, was too long for the body section I designed. So we had to pull the whole body side out 25 millimeters to house the key barrel. But that's what design's about. It's about problem solving. I, I, I loathe the notion of doing it. But then we balanced everything else up with it. And most people who saw the original one and then saw the production one would never know. But it's actually a lot wider than, than the flanks. And there were many little details like that. The car had to change and the, you know, the wheel arches the bonnet line, lots of things had to change. But we managed to protect the original concept that people recognized. And that's how the Vanquish came to be. So my design and style philosophy for the Vanquish was something more muscular. That's what Bob wanted. And we gave that to him. It's not more curvaceous, it's just exaggerated more. And that's what gives the car its muscle. One element of it that uh, I wanted to put into the car was I always loved the Zagato DB4 GT. Uh, of the 60s, and uh, had that lovely haunch in the back, which swept up off the door. And it was very much like cars of the era. I mean, the 250 short wheelbase Ferrari had a little bit of it as well. It wasn't that unusual, but it was so beautifully done, that car. And so I wanted a little bit of that car into the Vanquish and give it that muscle at the back. However, when we created it, and of course, remember, we're doing this into intersections and straight lines. I came in one day and I said, I really want this to be quite strong. This is to the modelers. So I picked a knife up. We used to sculpt on, with knives and clay and put lines on. And, and I, I went up to the door and I just swept a line down the door. I said to Andrew, who was modeling, I said, right, I want you to work to that intersection. Don't change it. And he said, are you serious? And they just saw this vertical line in the door and they thought I was slightly crazy. So no, it'll work. It'll be fine. So by the time we rounded the car off, the lines, that intersection stayed. It's still there. And I think it still works. It's dramatic part of the car that people love. So these things happen sometimes spontaneously. So, so that's how the, far, the form of the car came about. You know, we wanted the, the toughness, but again, keeping it clean. And another element of the design was I wanted the emphasis over the front wheel. And that's why if you look at the sill of the car, it's cut away and it, it throws the weight onto the front wheel visually. So you've got the wheel arch, then the sill cuts in like that. And it kind of envelops the front wheel with form, which gives it that sense of strength around the front. It's a little visual trick that I'd done before in other cars and it seemed to work. Philosophically, that's how the car came together. The interior was much more challenging, you know, because the components of the interior admittedly have a lot of Jaguar parts in there. In particular, the, the HVAC, the heater system, gets quite big. And so all that bulk you see in the center, I wanted to get rid of it and couldn't do that. Um, and so you have to cover the center part with, with a form, which is actually quite imposing. Also, there was a tendency to overlap all the forms as well in order to get the fit and finish to work rather than try and physically fit them together in a kind of crafted way because this is a production car. And one of the tricks to avoid gaps is to have surfaces overlapping other surfaces. And that's a little frustrating because you want things to be flush and, and, and smoothed out. We had challenges in the interior, but I managed to maintain much of the character of the concept car. But admittedly, I think the concept car interior was much better, you know, because it didn't have the same constraints of components that we had in the production one. Classifying the Vanquish is very difficult. I mean, in my mind, it's a GT. You can drive the car a long time, so it's a GT car in many ways. It's, it's visually a tour de force, you know, it's got a lot of presence in it. I don't think it's an out-and-out -out sports car. It's not designed to race around a track, although it's quite capable, I'm sure. It's got a luxurious presence to it, which is important. It's quite masculine, but it's got a presence to it, which kind of makes sure people notice it. But I think it's basically, it's a GT car. You know, it can be a two plus two, although originally 
The car was never meant to be a two plus two. It was always meant to be purely a two seater. The rear seats you see in some models came later on. If I'd known it was going to be a two plus two, I might have designed it slightly differently. So in some ways it's good. It was never designed that way because it kept its purity. But I think it's a, a selfish GT car. So as good as Vanquish is, obviously you felt there was a little unfinished business because now you're a free man uh, <laughs> and you're in Callum Designs, you've got the Callum 25. So you're reimagining Vanquish today. Talk us through the bits that you weren't quite happy with. And obviously in today's design language, if you reimagined Vanquish in 2002, for instance, it wouldn't be how you reimagine it today. So <clears throat> can you tell us a little bit about how design has changed and that has changed how you would reimagine Vanquish today rather than back in the era? Calm Design Studio, we decided to recreate the Vanquish and revisit it, remaster it effectively, put it through a new recording studio and see what would come out. But uh, we could do that. Two reasons I wanted to do it was that um, there were details of the car I was never entirely happy with. And that mattered because it was one of the cars that I, I really loved the most in my career. I look back at the Vanquish as a car that I had the most satisfaction with in so many ways. But I felt it, was just, it needed to be revisited. The details I wanted to look at, first of all, the stance of the car. The way it turned out, I always felt it was slightly overbodied, especially at the back. And I wanted to make sure the wheel arches were filled better and, and with, with bigger wheels. So we didn't readdress this purely as cosmetic thing to make it look better. We re-established a, a whole new um, setup with the suspension and brakes and the way the car drove as well. So you can't just put bigger wheels in the car and expect it to work. It won't work. You've got to address the whole setup of the suspension with it. And that's what we've done. The wheels are now bigger, they're wider, a bigger diameter. However, the design is still like the original design that we did all these years ago, because I like it. I didn't see any reason to change it. So although it's still the same design as the original Vanquish, the wheel is actually bigger in so many ways. But the net result is it fills the car better and makes the car look stronger. Starting at the front of the car, I've made the, the, the grille more assertive. And we've taken the lower lamps out. I never really liked them. By default, we took them off the DB7 V12 because they included the indicators and I think probably a fog lamp of some kind. The lamps in the upper half of the car couldn't include the indicators at the time. However, with new technology, LED technology on the upper lamps, we were able to fit all the indicator functions into the headlamp cowling. So that means I could negate the lamps in the lower half. And then we put wider vents in, we put brake cooling vents in the lower half. So we've changed the front end graphic quite considerably. As we go through the car, other details have changed. We've put more detail into the openings of the mesh. We've changed the, the side straight quite considerably in terms of detailing. And uh, we've changed the sill. So the front bumper's changed, the sill has changed. We've given it some carbon finish. And then we've changed the rear bumper completely. We've put a Venturi in there bigger pipes because the whole pipe systems, the exhaust pipe system has changed as well. And basically we've just given the car a much more modern look. So the stance of the car, the detailing of the car, of course we've changed the DLO, the daylight opening. Now one of my biggest problems with the original car was we picked up these generic extruded moldings and we kind of cut them up and put them on the original car around the window. I never had any shot moldings to get the corners right. They were just kind of joined, butted up. And I always felt they were very crude and the car deserved better. So now this car, the Callum one, now has a complete molding, which is one piece, made of carbon actually. And it just tidies up the aesthetic of the car completely. And the lower molding along the door has also changed to a much more modern um, inverted uh, rubber seal. It's not the sort of thing you notice immediately, but when you go up and look at it, these details belong to a modern car and not a car that's 25 years old. And so uh, it's very satisfying just to get these things right. The engine has been tuned, the suspension I say has been tuned, the car drives better, but the biggest change was the interior. So we've redesigned the whole interior. Now, architecturally it still looks similar, it still looks similar, but we've redesigned the whole interior and every panel is new, including the seats, 
the dashboard. We've got Bremont dials, the watch company. We've got a Bremont clock in the car. So it's very much more of a, a niche type of vehicle than the original one, much more detailed and much more individual. So any customer who wants one can come and choose the color they want, the materials of the interior, the leather color, and each car will be quite bespoke to the customer. So it's, it's a bit of fun. It's something that I feel very satisfied with. It's brought the car into the 21st century. And it works because the original design was effectively pretty good, even if I say so myself. And therefore it passed the test of time. And so we've got Aston's design language well and truly established uh, by your work on the DB7 and the Vanquish. And then Aston comes on to what turned out to be its second heyday, the V8 Vantage and the DB9. But similar to the DB7, the V8 Vantage and DB9 also had a bit of a turbulent backstory before they came to be into production. So you'd actually designed the mid-engined concept V8 Vantage, and then Aston realized that the DB7 wasn't gonna pass legislation, uh, missions would crash, and they actually needed to get a new GT car out. So that's where the DB9 came along, and you had to once again transpose a car design, the V8 Vantage, onto the GT platform and create a GT, which turned out to be the DB9. Now, like the DB7, the DB9 is a timeless classic, exquisitely beautiful, but you obviously learned well from the DB7 days, creating such a car from such constraints. Talk us through that whole era of Aston in, in those days, and the V8 and the DB9 story. So after, after we created Vantage, I was asked to look at doing a mid-engine car for Aston, which excited me hugely, because I love mid-engine cars. And this is Bob Dover's idea. And one of the reasons doing a mid-engine car, so he realized his sister company, Jaguar, were doing front-engine cars, and he wanted to kind of separate them more. It's a very logical idea, and he wanted the mid-engine car to be seen more as a Ferrari competitor. And so we created this mid-engine car, it's about the same size as Vantage we know today, and it had a V8 in the back. We got that car approved, and it, honestly, it was, it's one of the nicest cars I've ever worked on. I loved working on it. Again, I was kind of left alone to do it. It was cab forward. Uh, it had a proportion to it, which clearly said mid-engine. It was a very exciting little car. We took the model down to the south of France, where Jack Nasser happened to be, and he signed it off. So the project was a gore and we started developing it. And I can honestly say of all the Astons I designed, that was probably the most exciting one. Unfortunately, Dr. Betts came along and decided that he didn't want to do a mid-engine car. And so he said to me at the time, we have to make this front engine. I had a bit of an argument with him about it. You know, I said, why? He said, well, British car should be front engine. And I disagreed. I said, we've got to move on. So we actually, at that point, took the proportions of the car, we moved the cabin back. So we had a much longer bonnet on it and shorter front. The fundamental style of it was still the same. The proportions changed dramatically. That really was the starting point of the Aston Martin Vantage that we know today. But there was a sudden realization that DB7 was about to run out of legals. And by that mean it wouldn't crash, it wouldn't crash well in terms of legal requirements. It needed to be replaced quickly. And so I was stopped working on the V8 and said, right, we need a, a DB replacement. Assuming it'd be called DB8, of course. And, and so we went to town in it. And I picked up all the design cues that I'd learned on the smaller car I'd worked on and recreated it with another designer um, called Wayne Burgess. And he worked on it as well. And we'd recreated the form of this car over a longer platform and a dimension that we were given from the Aston engineering guys, and that evolved into the DB9. Again, the philosophy was keep it simple and pure, but beautiful. And what I did with this car was I picked up a lot of cues off of the, the Vanquish, which you can see, but has sveltness that the DB7 had, so it kind of sat between the two. I wanted to give it more muscle than the 7, but create something that still was just as elegant and just as beautiful, which at the time for me was hugely demanding. I mean, I really struggled hard to get the balance of this car right. Uh, when I look at it now, it's quite tame, but at the time, 
remember that you had before you start, you've got to almost uh, p push the limits of where you think the car can can go in terms of shape and form. There's a lot of form in the car. There's a lot of shape on it. In retrospect, maybe it could have been a bit stronger and a bit tougher. But overall, it came out as a very elegant car. And I, I still to this day, it's still a very beautiful car because it's kept simple, it's disciplined. And it's sat between seven, moving on to the next one and the Vanquish. I was careful it didn't look as tough as the Vanquish. I didn't want it to look as tough as the Vanquish because that was the muscle car of the family. But the form language was there and, and that car evolved. And so DB8 was born, but then they decided to call it DB9. I'm not quite sure why, maybe because it was an XK8 people might get confused with, or perhaps people thought it was a V8 engine in it when there was a V12 engine in it. So anyway, it became DB9. Nine's a nicer number anyway. And so then I was asked to go back and readdress the smaller car. I started looking at it because I wanted it to be different from where we started because we'd picked up a lot of cues off the V8 onto the DB9 and they were looking too similar. So I went back and readdressed the car with some graphic ideas of wrap around screen and just other details. But at that point, um, I was asked to stop and Henrik Fister came on board to, to look after the, uh, the Aston job. And I was kind of relegated to looking after Jaguars only. I was told you can't have a wife and a mistress at the same time. I think I also saw Aston as the mistress. <laughs> <laughs> Henrik wanted to change the DB9. He was told it was too late. He changed the tail lamps. So the tail lamps are, are his idea. I had round lamps at the back originally. And, and then he went to town on the, on the V8. And his, his first attempts were actually quite dramatically different. But for various reasons, of course, I'm not involved, so I don't know the full story, but it kind of retracted back much closer to the original design that we did. And so the last full car I worked on for Aston was probably the DB9. Although there's a lot of me in the Vantage as well. I have pictures of the original Vantage. I think it looks better, actually. And the mid-engine one definitely looks better. That's a fabulous car. The power was perfect. The weight distribution was perfect. So coming off the back of DB7 and Vanquish before the DB9 was launched in production, Dr. Betts wanted to jazz the company up a bit and he decided to rekindle the idea of the Zagato relationship. So now you've got your, your smooth, clean, classic, understated DB7, which has Zagato styling overlaid onto it. How do you feel about that Zagato interpretation? What, what are good design aspects? How can you talk us through that car? Yeah, I saw the Zagato for the first time. I went over to um, to the factory, the DB7 factory, and there was one sitting outside there. And I was quite surprised, a bit shocked. I'll be honest with you, I wasn't that keen about it because I'd worked so hard to make the DB7 look um, svelte. I like that word, you know, kind of lean, and beautiful and elegant. And this thing to me was a bit bulbous. It, it looked like it kind of eaten too much. Uh, relative to the car it came from. It had a big grill at the front, which was impressive. And so it had a lot more face to it. You know, it had it had a, a presence to it, perhaps, that was a little grander than the DB7. If I have one regret about the DB7, I think the grill was too small. But you know, when you're going through these notions of how big things should be, and the shape should be, what I was learning was you should exaggerate them. I didn't really know that then. So this bigger grill, on the Zagato certainly had a lot of presence and I, I, you know, I learned from that. But it had the double bubble at the back and it had a much wider track, which I believe was achieved by putting spacers on the back of the car, which is probably not the best way of developing the suspension. But I was never really that keen in the car. I just felt it was a little over, visually overweight for my liking. But I accepted what it was. It was, you know, it was a limited edition of the DB7. I was flattered that somebody even wanted to do it, but I wouldn't say it'd be one of my favorites, no. It just, felt a bit ponderous. It lacked that nimbleness that I felt the DB7 had, which an Aston should have. And I could see where it came from, you know, it had a lot of influence from the, the, the GT4 that Zagato had done years before. But that car was quite small. The DB7 Zagato was just a little overinflated for my liking. 
So here we have the uh, V12 Vantage uh, by Zagato. And the whole essence of this car really is to try and capture um, the, the embodiment of the original GT4 Zagato, which is quite a rounded car. And I think to that end, this car is pitched up quite beautifully. You can see it in the form around here and the form in the front and the overall form through the car, including the, the double bubble roof, incidentally. A couple of things that, you know, if I were to criticize, um, perhaps the grill. I like to do grills which, on Aston's, which tuck in at the bottom because it makes the grill a little bit happier. This does the opposite. Um, I'm sure they were trying to do something different, which is fine, but I think it makes the car look slightly sad. But apart from that, you know, it's a very strong face and a strong face these days is very, very important. Lovely headlamp detail, especially this feature here that runs off the wing and just darts into the, 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 the notional corner of this lamp. I really like that. Strong vents. And what I do like about the car is the fact it's very rounded but it has these sharp edges to it just to pick up the highlights and to determine the form uh, as much as possible. And that runs right through the car, through the door, and then just washes out into a softer form at the back. The way that any line should do, it should run through and kind of disappear. And then it has this very, very strong haunch at the back. Now, this has clearly been influenced by the original GT4, which has this muscular haunch. This one's very radial. I'm not sure um, I really feel that comfortable with it. It's very radial with the wheel arch. The original haunch on the GT4 was much more muscular. I'm not saying it should be copied. This is one way of doing it. It's strong. It's, uh, it's very evident, especially on the, the idea of the sharp edge. So it's probably just a matter of taste. I personally, they made it a bit more horizontal with a bit more snap. You get to the back of the car, these lovely details of the tail lamps, which protrude from the body, which is very strong indeed. So, but, but the main thing is the overall shape feels like a traditional Segata car. The one thing which is very challenging is what we call the wraparound screen, what I call the, um, the turret screen. And this is where designers try to create uh, a, a glass house which wraps around into the side uninterrupted. Now, this car inherently has an A-pill under the air, which is part of the donor car. So it's very difficult to move this to the right place. So it's been clad in carbon to try and uh, get it to disappear. And then the graphic of the screen wraps around and down into the, what we call the daylight opening line. Now, on the side of the car, this makes for a very, very strong graphic and a big statement. Um, it's frustrating this pillar has to be the, where it is because I think ideally it'd be nice if it had more wrap and the pillar was more discreet, but that's the, that's the nature of the beast. The one point which is difficult is, this is a strong graphic. It's fairly straight because it has to come off the line of the screen. And then the roof line does something completely different. Uh, it's slightly awkward because the intention of any turret screen like that is the roof should in some way be empathetic with the graphic of the car. In this case, it's, it's overly exaggerated. That difference is overly exaggerated. So it's a bit of a shame. I would like to have dropped this slightly and given it much more of a, a slimmer roof line, but then it might affect the package. But overall, the car really is uh, an example of capturing the idea of a voluptuous classic design an albeit a very modern chassis uh, to something that really relates to Zagata's past. Yeah, pretty cool. So thanks very much for running through the Aston design language, the DNA which, which you are responsible for. Before we let you go, we've got some quick fire questions. <laughs> to be awarded the CBE in the design world is extremely rare. And if you take iconic designers such as Malcolm Sayer and his designs with Jaguar, you've eclipsed that. Your, your design portfolio is insane. Five Astons, a load of Fords, RS2000s. You've got the uh, Jaguar. XK, XJ, F-Pace, 
it, it, the portfolio is insane. How do you feel being the best car designer in the world? Oh my goodness, that's very flattering. Um, I don't really think of it that way. I mean, Malcolm Sayer was one of my heroes and you know, I have two or three design heroes. He was a brilliant man, he was a mathematician. He approached things differently than, than perhaps I would, but he still created some of the most iconic cars ever. And I don't think anybody has really surpassed the E-Type yet. How do I feel about it? I, I'm, the problem is I look back on what I've done and, and I can see a lot of good stuff. I also see the stuff that I might have missed, stuff that's not quite right. And, and so I, I, I never want to rest in my laurels in that respect. You know, I came into this business because I love creating things. I love to make things. I love to design things. And, you know, I certainly didn't come into it for the glory or, the, or to be noticed. I want to, just to design stuff and enjoy that process of designing beautiful cars and give other people enjoyment through that. That's my objective. And so rather than thinking about what I've done in the past, which you're right, I've got a fairly extensive portfolio. Um, I've been very fortunate to be given the opportunity, but the driving force was just wanting to design beautiful things. And I think once you've done that once, people give you the chance to do it again and again. And that's what's happened. But I'm always thinking forward as well. You know, I'm never satisfied with what I've done, frankly. I don't think most good designers should be. And that's why I'm continuing with, with the design world, you know, in my own small business, because I want to create more stuff that I can get more fun out of and more satisfaction out of. It may work, it may not work, but at least I'll give it a shot. You know, I'm very flattered with the CBE, but the most important thing is designing the car. That's it. That's what really matters, is designing the car. Everything else is peripheral. That's it. Now, I know you own a fair few cars. Uh, yes. What is the car that you sit in and you just feel at home in, you love driving, every time you sit in the seat, close the door, start the engine up, every minute in, in that car you love, what is that car? I've got a group of cars that I love and I bought them because I've always wanted one. The cars I sit in and get the most enjoyment out of, there are two actually. I've got a, a 993 911, which I love and it's been stripped out and it's kind of track spec. I love driving it. But the car that really gives me the biggest buzz is a 1995 Mini Cooper. And I've, you know, I've lowered it, I've got the wider wheels, I've got the, the racing seats in it. It's been mildly tuned, but I get into that car, I feel so at home. You know, I'm, 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 I'm sitting in that little seat and I've got a little steering wheel in front of me and oh, it's such a joy. It's a go-kart. And I've had that car for over 20 years now. I'll never give it up. It's the one car I always get into and it makes me smile. And it makes other people smile too, because you don't see that many of them anymore. So. That's my favorite, really. Yeah, that's a life for that one, definitely. <laughs> so a car company you've never worked for, a project that you've never had anything to do with, maybe you own the car, maybe you don't. What is the car that you look at in terms of design <coughs> and you just think, yeah, that's perfect. It's, it's a really good, it's captured the time or captured an emotion. Uh, what car is it? Well, if you don't include the ones that I've worked on myself, um, I'd have to say Porsche 911. I've got great love for Porsche 911s, but not for the reason that other people have. I, I started off in my younger years with a couple of Beetles, and I kind of I have a fondness for air-cooled engines. I don't know why. It's the simplicity of them. It's the noise of them. They make a lovely noise, and and so I fell in love with with Beetles at an early age, and I've I've rebuilt a couple, and um, that grew to Porsches. So, and the 911s. You know, a grown-up Beetle really, isn't it? The air-cold ones are. And so um, I've always had a fondness for 911s, and I still like them. There aren't many 911s I don't like, but the 993 is my favourite. But if there's a car I wish that I'd worked on at some point, it'd be a Porsche 911. Challenging car to work on. I mean, the engine's in the wrong place for a start. There's something very charismatic about them that I enjoy, and they're fun. Another car which, which uh, goes back a bit is the Lancia Stratus. I think that's a fabulous little piece of design work. Quite a handful to drive, I hear. I've never driven one, but uh, I love the Lancia Stratus. It's just a 
perfect piece of Italian design. And finally, future and, and car design. Uh, you're famed for commenting once uh, whilst working at Jaguar that form must follow function, but it's Jaguar's function to look beautiful. Indeed. And, you know, when you're designing something, you, when you start off, you have to decide where your list of attributes lie. And if your attributes for this vehicle is going to be functionality, you know, you can get five people in it, then the Jaguar or an Aston Martin are probably not the cars to buy. But if you want something you can get four people into or even two people that are beautiful objects, then the form of the car matters as much as the function of the drivability. But if you make that decision up front, everybody understands it, that's fine, that's clear. And so, yeah, form is part of the function of certain brands of cars. Even more so now, people buy cars because they like the look of them. And so it's important we create cars which people like to look at. And that's how I feel about it. Now, if I was to design a van, clearly it wouldn't have a sloping roof in the back, would it? It'd be a box, but hopefully it'd be a beautiful box, but it'd still be a box. So uh, you, have to, you have to take on board what you're trying to do at the onset of starting any project. Well, we're at a bit of a shift change in the industry where the internal combustion engine is being phased out and electric seems to be the path that many a manufacturer are following. And a lot of car design, um, a lot of Aston's DNA has its form in the function of an internal combustion engine. Uh, how do you see that? form changing when the electric engine has different functions? Yeah, I'm very torn in this, I have to admit. I mean, as a kind of a, a real petrol head and a designer of cars that I've known all my life, you know, the idea of the demise of the internal combustion engine as a working entity is, is quite sad because it's a beautiful thing and so complicated, you know? You think the sophistication in a, in a, in a, in a modern, V8, V12, or even a four-cylinder. It's, it's a fabulous piece of engineering. And, you know, soon there'll be very few of them around. Um, on the other hand, I understand the reasons. We're going to be forced and we're going to have to move into electric cars. I actually enjoy electric cars. I've owned an I-Pace, which I was very fortunate to have worked on, of course. And it's a fabulous thing to own. So they both have different characteristics. But eventually, that world of internal combustion engines will diminish because of because of co2 and because of what we're doing to the planet i've got a sort of mild hope that somebody will create a fuel which is co2 free if that's possible and then we can continue with internal combustion engines there's a, a feeling about a mechanical engine which you just don't get in an electrical engine but there are different attributes they have uh, different qualities. But if you want to take somebody on at the traffic lights, the electric car will win every time, I tell you. Not to 60 times, they're insane. And one of the interesting thing, of course, with electric cars is we're gonna to have to temper that. You know, people are gonna decide, well, we can do not to 60 in three seconds and your family hatchback. We're not gonna let you do that because it's probably not for everybody. And they will detune these engines so they only do not to 60 in five and a half or six seconds, which once upon a time was a very fast car. So it's gonna be interesting how they evolve, how they develop. So I'm torn, but it's an inevitability. It's been really interesting to hear your story, uh, hear your design language throughout these five classic Astons um, that you've created. So thanks for coming to Petrol Revolt today, and we'll let you get back to Callum Designs. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. How awesome was that interview of Ian? And I can't believe how humble and down to earth he is and that his favorite car is a 95 Mini Cooper. Head over to our Facebook page and website to get more information about our track days and merch. Join us next time on Petrol Revolt. Yeah.